Let's kick it off. It's Wednesday, week seven, lecture seven B. Today we're doing the Brayton cycle. And so I thought I'd start with a review of last lecture, just mention what we talked about last lecture. Um, I also released the assignment specification last night. Uh, and so I thought I'd give an opportunity for anyone who'd read that to ask questions of clarification. Um, who read the assignment specification? I'll call that 30% of the class. That's all right. Yep, that's fine. That's, I mean, it's only been up for a couple of hours. Um, so I'll give, I'll give an opportunity to ask questions about that. Having mentioned yesterday that we should keep in mind our learning outcomes for the course, I thought I'd just throw the learning outcomes up and we can see how we're going. Uh, and then we'll whack into the Brayton cycle itself. That's frozen, which is going to be, which is great for now. Excellent. So what did we talk about yesterday? So yesterday we followed on on this lecture last week uh, with entropy, and I talked about calculating the entropy change in solids, liquids, and gases. So you've got a solid at the start of a process, a liquid at the start of a process. It goes through a process to state two. What's the change in entropy? And also for gases. And so that's part of our energy balance uh, equation, our entropy balance equation, I'm sorry, uh, which is related to our second law of thermodynamics. So that's done that. We also covered the diesel cycle. That took a little while. And I primarily did it in terms of how is the diesel cycle different from the auto cycle. And then I mentioned the dual cycle. Didn't do any analysis on it. But just to say, look, the really reality is somewhere in between them uh, often. And we can do things to manipulate the cycles as we care to. So that's what we covered yesterday. Um, hopefully that all felt like it fit in. Learning outcomes. So when I mentioned that you've all read the course outli outline and you're tracking the learning outcomes, and everyone kind of giggled, that's fine. Um, this is the learning outcomes that's in chapter four, I think, just before assessment. And then the assessment maps the assessments in the course back to the learning outcomes. So you can know um, what outcomes are being tested in each quiz um, and in the assignment and so forth. So let's just give them a little bit of a read. Use the first law to solve steady state and transient problems in open and closed systems. So we've done steady state Open systems, I believe. So this is like, you know, fluids traveling through a throttle, nozzle, turbine, you know, insert device here, uh, in a steady state way. Use the first law of thermodynamics, yes, as use the first law of thermodynamics, good, um, to calculate the temperature, pressure, enthalpy at the exit conditions. That kind of problem. Right? We've done transient problems on closed systems. Cylinder starts at X pressure, volume, whatever, compresses to X temperature, you know, so X volume. Um, what's the, you know, heat, whatever. You know, heat across the boundary if it ends at a certain temperature, that sort of thing, right? Uh, what we haven't done here is the transient problems on open systems, okay? And we'll get there, we just haven't done it yet. So we haven't done transient on open systems and that is uh, for example, pressurized cylinder of carbon dioxide, open the valve, why does it get cold? Why does the cylinder get cold and the, um, and the gas coming out of it gets cold? That's a transient open problem. And we just haven't gone there yet. Demonstrate knowledge of the second law. So you have to demonstrate, this is what I test you to do. I test that you can demonstrate knowledge of the second law of thermodynamics by solving steady state problems on open and closed systems. Right? So. It's less, There's, you're not doing transient um, uh, entropy generation. Transients is first law. Now you're just doing um, more steady state um, or I guess transient closed. Uh, so that's there. So this is what one and two, neglecting transient open systems, is what you should currently feel confident with. So if you don't feel that you've learned those things, then some of that's incumbent on me as a teacher and some of that's incumbent on you as a student to have undertaken to learn those things. Um, learning outcome three, 
is what we're in the middle of right now. Apply the first and law, second laws to analyze the behavior of internal combustion engines. So that's auto, diesel, dual, Brayton. Uh, air standard cycles, so they're things that use air. And Rankine power cycles, so we'll go into that next. And vapor compression refrigeration cycles, and we'll go into that last. Right, so this is kind of in order what we're learning. So we're about halfway through internal combustion engines at the moment. And then learning outcome four, identify leaks between theoretical analysis methods that you learn with me, and actual performance of thermodynamic machines and devices. That is like a learning outcome that you achieve yourself through undertaking the assignment and participating in the forums and meeting with your peer and doing your own research and so forth. So I don't directly lecture to that, although I do mention it as we kind of go along, but this is like your, you go out, you explore the real world, and you identify what do we learn in class that is immediately applicable and what do we learn in class we have to um, uh, modify and, and put some reality around. So that's the learning outcomes. Hopefully your experience of learning this course lines up with my expectation of it. Um, obviously that can be, there can be a huge disconnect between what I think you're learning and what you're learning. Um, metacognition, it's on you. Any questions about learning outcomes, comments? Good. Love it. Just love the... Does anyone know what this is and where it is? Yes, is the answer. Good, you've walked past it. The, you know there's no... Sorry, sorry, for those who don't know, this is... Um, right? It's just near the undergraduate teaching lab. Um, the photo on the right is the view you get from the outside of the door, but from the inside of the door, there's no shielding. So you can go up and don't touch it, but you can. Um, did anyone say what it was, or did anyone just say where it is? Jet engine. Happy with that? Cool. So we've got, I think, feels to me like the gas is flowing from the top to the bottom. Um, I reckon the more you know about stuff, yeah. Is it real? Yes. Is it just repainted? Uh, I'd say it'd be painted for um, protection, and obviously it's had a cross section taken out of it. But my understanding is it's a real one. It's actually it's got the name, it's got the manufacturer nameplate there, and it's got a plaque sp telling the story on the wall, who made it, and why it was donated, I believe. No, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I reckon the more you know about stuff, the more you see when you see something. Like if you, you know, you've all done statics and dynamics and so forth. You know, like someone's throwing a ball, dynamics, someone who's uninformed about physics can see certain things about it, but once you are informed, you see more. You see different equations, you start thinking about things. I reckon this is the sort of thing you can look at a couple of times throughout the course of your degree and see different things each time. Like I look at it and, I stand there until it's awkward and weird. When my colleagues walk past, I'm like, oh, okay. Um, you know, as you start to get a bit more, like a lot more understanding of fluid mechanics, this compressor and the turbine are fascinating. How it tries to establish combustion in the combustion chamber. Anyway, I think it's fascinating, worth a look. If you did one thing this week for thermodynamics, you'd read the assignment spec. No, you should have a look at that sometime over the next couple of weeks in detail. And uh, what do you understand? What don't you understand? Where are the bearings? Where are the seals? What's each of the mechanisms doing? I would recommend. Um, here's another thing about learning outcomes. I kind of threw this up uh, in week two, I think. Okay, I said in thermo, we've got a couple of different um, types of problems. We've got two fluids that we might use, an ideal gas, and when we work with an ideal gas, we do a lot of uh, calculations. There's some equations to track the properties of the gas as it goes along, or we deal with pure substances. When we deal with pure substances, there's lots of lookup tables and interpolation involved. If you track the ideal gas, the blue line's down. If the processes are transient, then you're probably talking about either an auto or a diesel engine, or dual, I guess, by um, inference. Dual's not really a cycle, that we, it's just a combination of the other two. 
And so you're looking at an internal combustion engine. Or if you've got an ideal gas or an air standard cycle in a, in a steady state mode, then it's a Brayton cycle and you're looking at a gas turbine engine. And then there's pure substances and so forth. So I, I hope you feel like we're progressing through this um, and learning things we need to know. To know about cycles. Before I start talking about the Brayton cycle, are there any questions about the assignment from anyone who's read the spec? Um, I can also answer questions on the forum. I just thought while we're together. Good, excellent. No worries. Let's talk about the Brayton cycle. What are gas turbine engines used for? What's the gas turbine engine in the bottom right hand corner of this picture being used for? Like as in what overall function, what are we trying to achieve by having, we've paid money to have physical insulation and what's it doing? Probably. It's not a wind tunnel. No, it's a thermodynamic device. So it will, um, it will be burning fuel to, I would suggest that it's generating electricity. Um, it, because we pretty much use gas turbine engines either to generate electricity or to power planes. At the moment, helicopters use gas turbine engines as well. Um, and this one's bolted down. So it's got a foundation here and it's bolted down. So I, I propose that's being used for electricity generation. Um, uh, someone asked a question after the lecture yesterday, do the different cycles have different advantages and disadvantages? Absolutely yes. And that's why um, you notice that when we started building planes, maybe you didn't, I wasn't around either, um, we used a petrol <coughs> auto cycle internal combustion engine Right, propeller planes initially were piston powered, um, and now they've got turbines. Right? What's the thing that you expect a plane to do that you don't expect a car to do that has thermodynamic relevance as to why you might not be able to use an internal combustion engine? Change in pressure. Absolutely. So we expect planes to fly high in the air. Up, 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 up. Yeah, well done, Daniel. We expect planes to fly high up in the air where the pressure is low, and so having a compressor at the leading edge of the system is, um, is a way that you can achieve reasonable combustion in a rarefied atmosphere. So, yes, Chris. Um, do you ever really need to control much that much, or is the fact that they're steady state most of the time also beneficial for the turbine to Do you need to? Yes, that's also true. Yes, so with a gas turbine engine, I should have, uh, gas turbine engines operate, they only operate well over pretty fixed, cheers, over pretty fixed uh, RPM range, um, whereas compression internal combustion engines, um, so cylinder basic internal combustion engines operate over a very wide rev range. So yeah, you go city driving, country driving, versus, um, you notice we're operating these without gearboxes as well. So yeah, you just set, set the speed, design for cruising altitude, and go. Good point. Good. So this is a kind of question we might, uh, we might get. Stationary power plant operating on an ideal Brayton cycle, has a compression ratio of 12. We're given a gas temperature in the inlet. Um, and a gas temperature after the combustion chamber, as it turns out to be, of 1300K. Um, using cold air assumption to determine, and I ended up adding an extra point as well, gas temperature the exit and eggs, um, gas temperature at all the points, and back work ratio, which is a term we need to introduce, and then thermal efficiency. So let's calculate, this is a pretty standard uh, question set, let's calculate the thermal efficiency of this Brayton cycle. So, um, we use these for two reasons. One's energy, energy generation, electricity generation. The other one is turbojets, turbofans and turbo. I haven't actually put um, helicopters there, but that would be very similar to energy generation. 
as in electricity generation. A turbojet, if you're generating electricity with a gas turbine engine, or you're using a turbojet engine, how might those applications be different? I say turbojet as opposed to turbofan, because turbofan is a bit more like electricity generation. But what's the benefit you can get in a turbojet engine that gives you no benefit if you're bolting something to the ground? Accelerating the gas out the back? Absolutely. So turbojet engines have hot gas going out the back at a high velocity, which gives you additional thrust. Whereas for electricity generation, you want to draw all of the energy you can and use it to run your, um, your generator. So they're, they're a different case, very different case. Um, so this should look familiar. We did this for the auto cycle and diesel cycle as well. So we're talking about air standard. So composition doesn't change. Um, it's not true, but it's the assumption we make. It makes the analysis easier. I mentioned with the auto cycle, it's got four processes that occur in the same place at different times. So it's a reciprocating engine. With these engines, it's got four processes that are taking place continually, and they're spaced by distance. So you start with the compressor, you've got a, a somewhere a different place that combustion takes take place, and a different place that there's a turbine. Uh, we would expect to see, if you, if you design this, um, you would normally have the compressor and the turbine sh share a single shaft. So you'd say they're going to run at the same speed. So whatever speed the compressor is running at, the turbine will also run at. Or you might have a set of shafts. So you might have uh, a compressor running at a certain speed and an associated turbine, like a first stage compressor and second stage turbine, and a second stage compressor and first stage turbine. Um, so you can have them running at different speeds. Your overall net work out of your system, your net power out of your system, is your work in minus your work out or rather, sorry, the work out that you get in, minus the work you have to run your compressor. And it's not based on the Carnot cycle, so I'll introduce the Erickson cycle, which is a similar uh, intellectual exercise, but just um, laid out a little bit differently. So this was our Carnot cycle, so I'll start there and then go to the Brayton. This was our Carnot cycle, a bit of a review. We had a gas, it also works with a pure substance, but you, you've, got, oh, you've got gas in a cylinder, and it's having heat added, then it's expanding, then it's having heat removed, and then it's compressing. And I got, had a question this morning, which was a good, oh, this afternoon, which was a good question. Uh, someone talked about infinitesimally small temperatures, and then said, thermal is one minus Tc on Th. If Tc is infinitesimally different to Th, don't you get very bad efficiencies? It was a good question as much as the temperature difference between this surrounding and this fluid is infinitesimally small, and the temperature difference between this fluid and this surrounding is infinitesimally small, so they are very small temperature differences, but the temperature difference between TH and TC is as big as you can make it. So just um, a point of clarification there. So we're going between some low temperature and some high temperature. And we've got a TS diagram and a PV diagram showing the pressures and uh, specific volumes. So that was our Carnot, oops. That was our Carnot cycle, sorry. Carnot cycle, that's just the heading. Because now the Ericsson cycle looks like this. So it's not a piston device that's undertaking four processes, which is, so the auto cycle was our introduction to, the Carnot cycle was our introduction to the auto cycle, right? So we're not having a reciprocating engine here, so it makes sense that we would have a different idealization that has now four different components, or three different components, four different uh, states, physically dislocated from one another. So you start here, with air, you compress the air through a turbine, but as you do, you keep the temperature constant. So normally when you compress air through a turbine, you're not compressing it through a turbine, you're expanding it. Sorry. Give me a moment, I'm gonna have a drink. 
and take 10 seconds because I'm using the wrong words for stuff. Imagine if I spoke for a living. <laughs> Wouldn't that be dreadful? <clears throat> there. How are you guys doing? I said that I don't know. Me talking for long periods of time isn't something I like. Rio, good, good. Let's start again. Ericsson cycle. Let's start at state point one with a hot temperature, high pressure gas. Okay? Expand it through a turbine. Normally, as you expand through a turbine, you expect the temperature to reduce. Okay? But this time, we're going to immerse the turbine in some sort of hot temperature reservoir that transfers heat to the turbine so that as the gas is uh, expanding, the temperature is remaining constant. And the temperature difference between the reservoir and the gas will be infinitesimally small. So that, that assumption is still holding. So we're still undertaking an expansion operation and maintaining the temperature constant, but now we're just doing it in a turbine and doing it continuously. Now we're taking that hot temperature, low pressure uh, gas through a regenerator, and it's going from temperature hot to temperature cold, at the same time as gas coming back is going from temperature cold to temperature hot over an infinitesimally small temperature difference across the entire length. Okay, so you can imagine this regenerator is like a heat exchanger where this fluid is coming in at TH, TH and going out at TC, going that way. And there's another fluid coming in at Tc minus delta, you know, something infinitesimally small, and going that way, and its temperature is increasing over displacement. So sorry, this is the temperature axis, and this is some um, length or x or distance axis. Right? So your regenerator is causing one of the fluids to become cold while the other one becomes hot. Over again, for, to be idealized, all these have to be infinitesimally small. Um, then you take your cold, now low pressure gas and put it into a compressor. As we compress a gas, we would normally expect the gas to get hotter. But now we're soaking the compressor in a cold reservoir that's the same temperature or very much the same temperature as the incoming cold gas. Okay, and we're maintaining that cold temperature until state point four and then running it back through the regenerator. So you end up getting efficiencies that are the same as the Carnot cycle. All of the processes are internally reversible, so they're all idealized. The graph looks a little bit different. So the TS, for example, is skewed off to the right here. Right? If I just bring up the Carnot cycle again, so I'm going to go back a page. So for Carnot, he imagined a perfect square being drawn in the TS domain. For Ericsson, it's pushed off to the right, but whatever entropy is transferred f to the fluid between process four and one, so this is entropy going into the fluid, is the same as the entropy being removed from the fluid in process two to three. So there's no entropy generation throughout the cycle. There's entropy change within the fluid, but no generation. And then it's the, there's a PV diagram there as well. And so it's just a different way of receiving the same efficiencies. And it leads us to the idea there might be some other type of device, in this case, something with a turbine, a compressor, and a regenerator, some way of getting heat into the system um, that will uh, serve as a model for our next cycle. Thoughts, questions? Good. So, how does that lead us then to the Brayton cycle? You can see a schematic diagram in the top right-hand corner, process flow diagram. So the idea is that we take air off an atmospheric, or it can be any, can be any working fluid, but for our purposes we think of atmospheric air generally. So we take some air, we put it into a compressor, and raise both the temperature and the, uh, and the pressure. Put it into a combustor, add some heat, and that adds more temperature to the fluid and then run it back through a turbine and get low pressure 
hotter gas out than you put in. The turbine produces some work, and then some of that work you run back into your compressor. So because you've often got a, I've got a green dotted line there to indicate that might be on a common shaft, it doesn't have to be. You could use the turbine to run a generator to make electricity, and then use the electricity to run a motor to run the compressor. But if you're going to design the system anyway, put them on a common shaft and neglect all of the um, efficiency losses associated with generation and the motor effect. So that's what our system looks like. We model it as a closed system, like we did with our auto cycle. So we say that the hot gas then becomes cold again and goes back into the compressor. In reality, by the time you've had combustion, you'll exhaust your gas somewhere else and you'll draw in fresh atmospheric air. But from a modeling perspective, it lets us do things like say, there's some heat lost in this heat exchanger on the outside. So it helps us with that kind of modeling. And it also opens up the possibility of doing things like running this with argon, because we'll see that K has a, um, the higher the K is for the fluid, the higher the efficiency. So we could run this with, for example, argon or neon. Le Noble, feels right. And we could actually have a closed system, a closed cycle. We could have some way of heating the gas up here. We could have some way of cooling the gas down there. And we could run the Brayton cycle, not on air, but on some other fluid. So having it as a heat exchanger opens that up as a possibility. All the devices are open steady state, steady flow devices. So with our auto cycle, everything was a closed device because all the processes took place when the valves were closed. Here, all of the devices are open. And there's a steady mass flow rate of air. So whatever mass flow rate of air comes into the compressor must leave the turbine. Um, there's no change of mass over time within the system. The actual system's open, but we model it as closed. As I said, or the actual system is typically open. We model it as closed. Um, there is a line here as kind of drawn. Everything on this side of the line could be considered to have a low pressure and everything above the line is at a high pressure. So whatever pressure the compressor adds to the fluid, the turbine removes from the fluid. And this is different from our auto cycle. From the auto cycle you had this occurring on a volumetric basis. So some of the things happened at bottom dead centre when the volume was large. Some things happen at top dead centre where the volume was small, but the pressure changed when your spark ignited. Right? So you had a pressure increase in the cylinder when you ignited the spark. Here, as you go through the combustor, you don't have a pressure change. And that's a difference that I wanted to draw to your attention. Because the combustor, if I had the photo back up, because the combustor is basically a pipe with a flame in it, Okay, you need the pressure to be lower in the direction you want the fluid to go in order to induce the fluid to go in that direction. So you can't, because what I, you know, intuitively in my head, what I think happens is when you ignite a flame, you increase the pressure. But if that happened, you'd get back pressure against your compressor and your fluid wouldn't keep flowing. So just worth noting, that once pressure at point two is the same at pressure at point three, and pressure at point four is the same at pressure at point two, in, uh, pressure point one, pressure four is the same as pressure one, in the ideal case, in reality, pressure one will be slightly lower, and pressure four will be slightly higher, because you'll draw the air in, and so it'll be slightly below atmospheric, and you'll have to force the air out at point four, so the pressure will be slightly higher, like slightly. So we're talking, you know, 10 kPa kind of pressures. And in reality, <coughs> pressure two must be higher than pressure three in order to induce, so pressure three must be lower, in fact, in order to induce flow through the combustor. Yeah? If it's an open system, how would they change the pressures if it's atmospheric? If it's an open system, how would they change the pressures if it's atmospheric? Yep. It's not the same air that's coming into like the combust as a compressor again. How would they change the pressures? Wouldn't the coming out be 
one bar and filling in one bar as well? Yeah, so in the ideal case, the pressures at point four and one are the same. Yes, they are. Uh, in the real case, just in order to, I mean, same for your car, you've got an exhaust system, so you've got a, um, you know, a muffler and a catalytic converter and so forth. So you really need the air to be like 110 kPa in order to, to flow out, you know, in order to, to push the, the air through. So I'm just saying, you know, this might be like 106 and coming in might be 99. You know, so there's a slight draw on the air on the way in. In a plane, you get some, some nice effects where you're traveling into the air, so it naturally compresses in. Uh, and you might have a diffuser that captures the air, which takes, so a diffuser converts kinetic energy to pressure energy. So if you've got air coming in and you can capture it in a diffuser, then it will, um, it might bump the pressure up a little bit for free, which is nice. So, but in general, you can treat it to be, there's a low pressure side and a high pressure side of the system, and the pressure is the same. And in the ideal case, the shaft work machine, so the compressor and the turbine, are both considered isentropic. Uh, and we know how to deal with isentropic compression, PV to the power of N, or PV to the power of K, and so forth. Yeah, Chris? Um, the difference between a diffuser and a difference between a diffuser and a nozzle? I covered it when I did thermodynamic devices in what feels like week four, but basically a nozzle, if these are subsonic, so we, we haven't gone supersonic, because um, that just goes weird, a nozzle will increase your velocity, right, so this is a nozzle, velocity, I'm sorry, velocity will go up, and pressure will go down in a nozzle. A diffuser must be the other way. Velocity will go down and pressure will go up. Yes, yeah, good question. Excellent. Cool, so what do the different devices do? Yes? So just to backtrack a bit. Yeah. We're talking about one of the, actually a couple of questions. Yeah, no worries, that's good. So you were Yes. In, in practice, do they ever try and recapture that lost work? Like yes. Yeah. So the, the question is about the energy lost out the back. I don't know whether it's a question, but that's okay. But so I guess it's the difference between these three devices, turbojet, turbofan, and turboprop, and what they're trying to achieve. Um, We'll only, I think we'll only talk about those two. So basically with turbojet, you end up with hot gas coming out the back and you put it through a nozzle to increase its velocity. And we know momentum has to be conserved. So if you shoot something fast that way, you kind of go that way. Um, with a turbofan, what you do instead is pass the compressor. So you have a compressor, combustor, and a turbine and so forth. On this side of the compressor, you put a low pressure fan that tries to induce a large mass of air to accelerate just a little bit. And so a turbo fan, you'll find the turbine is then used to drive through to the fan at the front. And then yes, exhaust gas, capturing the energy in exhaust gas, uh, it's being worked on and often the capital expenditure doesn't justify. One of the things you need planes to be is light. And so you've got it. So you both want the capital cost to be low and the mass to be low. Um, and certainly redirecting any air back around to do something. Like say you wanted to use the air at the back to preheat prior to combustion or something like that. Changing the velocity, you know, you might lose some of the momentum effects. So yeah. Yeah, good. It's a good thought, though. Love it. Plenty of time. Cool. 
So what are, the, what are the four processes, or how do we model them? We have reversible adiabatic compression. This is the same as our auto cycle, but it's important to know that it's an open system, not a closed system. That, that changes the way we have to do our first law. We have isobaric heat addition. So isobaric heat addition feels like our diesel cycle. Uh, again, open rather than closed, but um, we assume the combustor inlet and outlet pressures are the same. Reversible adiabatic expansion for our turbine in the ideal case. I need to talk about compressor and turbine efficiency. Maybe I'll do that next week. And then modeled as isobaric heat rejection, but really is exhaust and intake. So um, process 4.1, I've put it in square brackets to say, well, that's how we model it, but that's what it really is. What do the charts look like? This is uh, Reissel's view on the charts. So because our compression process is isentropic, entropy doesn't change as temperature rises. And then we've got some combustion process, which rises entropy. Then we've got an expansion process, isentropic expansion process, which drops it back down. Uh, PV, obviously something different. Compress the gas, add heat at the same pressure, so it's a horizontal line, expand the gas. Right? So that's that. Um, I preferred the shape of Sengel and Bowles' graphs, so I put those in the lecture notes as well. Um, it's exactly the same thing, it's just the curves are just slightly different for nuanced reasons that no one else will notice. For non-ideal cases, all right, and this is maybe treading on something I need to introduce next week, um, which is fine. So during our compression process, if it was ideal, we would go to this point here. But in reality, you can't achieve ideal compression, and so some entropy is generated, and you end up here. For the turbine case, ideally you would have isentropic uh, expansion, and you'd end up at that point there. In reality, uh, entropy is generated in the turbine, and you end up a little bit across, and it hurts you on both hurts you both ways. So having non-ideal compression hurts you; you don't achieve what you wanted to achieve, and having non-ideal turbine hurts you. So uh, we should cover that. But I just wanted to mention that's where the non-ideal cases come in. And also, you know, are these processes really isobaric? I suggest that there's a slight pressure uh, drop across those processes as well. How do we analyze them? So if the question says there's a Brayton cycle, this is what you need to analyze. Well, we start with our first law for open steady state steady flow systems. This is not the same equation we started with for our auto and diesel cycles. I've already pre-simplified the first law down. So for example, for Brayton and Otto, it was Q, it ended up being Q minus W equals uh, M dot delta U. Now it's Q dot minus W dot equals M dot delta H. You should know why that's different. And if not, review your, your work on closed and open systems. Um, but that's our final simplification for our four processes. And then here are our four processes in words on the left and in equations on the right. And we find that it just becomes the specific heat at constant pressure for the working fluid times the difference in temperatures for all of the four processes. So the analysis looks simple, and it is simple, um, at the end of all that. I hope. Simple but not trivial. How do we calculate efficiency? So can we know efficiency based only on the minimum number of parameters? Yes, we can. So same as the Otto cycle, we end up with an equation for the Brayton cycle only based on ratio R and specific heat ratio K. I think it's worth pointing out this ratio R is not the same, this is a pressure ratio. So for the Brayton cycle, you get a pressure ratio. For the Otto cycle, you got a volumetric ratio. So R for the compression ratio for an Otto cycle is V1 divided by V2. 
the compression ratio for the Brayton cycle is P2 divided by P1. So it's a pressure ratio, not a volumetric ratio. This gives you slightly lower values for the same compression ratio than the auto cycle analysis did. But here, we're not pre-feeding the gas in as well. So um, knock isn't a problem for us. And so we can achieve higher pressure ratios than we could achieve volumetric ratios with the auto cycle. So you can get on par kind of, kind of analysis. I had a thesis student. Do you stick with it? No, he's going to something else. Had a thesis student looking at the feasibility for using gas turbine engines to run trucks um, because you can achieve some uh, efficiency gains. And he found there was a company, I think it was based in New Zealand, oh, I, I can't remember, that actually was making garbage trucks out of this and got into miles per gallon was much better. They were using gas turbine engines at their ideal RPM to charge a battery and then using the battery to operate the, the truck and ran some trial runs and could achieve much better, um, much lower emissions and fuel use. Anyway, <laughs> just something to do. It didn't, didn't work out when it was cars. It had to, you had to run them a lot. Um, so heavy vehicles made more sense. The efficiency increases with compression ratio. At some point we can't go any hotter any, any further compressed because of typically material temperature limits, so strength limitations. Uh, and as materials get better, we can, we can push that, that envelope a little bit. Are there any questions before I look at the question? Excellent. So let's do this. Oops. One note. Oh, I can write stuff by hand. I've also got it all typed up. Do you have a preference between me writing things by hand? I mean, literally, it's, it's PowerPoint slides, but it's hidden from you so that I can write it down. Um, can we take a vote on it? People who like to see me write on one note and I, I sketch things out. I'm calling that 90%. People who would who, who like to see it typed, my handwriting is too messy for you. Good. Okay, that's fine. Good. Right. Writing it out. So, this is the question. I just I appreciate knowing what you like. Uh, so we've got a, a Brayton cycle. We've got a compression ratio. We understand that's a pressure compression ratio, which is different than the volumetric. We've got a few temperatures. We're using the cold air standard, and we're determining a bunch of stuff. So what are the things that we know? I should draw a cycle over here, just so we agree on the state points. Call this state point one, two, three, four. So we're given the temperature of the inlet 300K, we're given the temperature after the combustion chamber. That may seem like an unusual spec to be given, but if you knew your turbine had a maximum inlet temperature of 1300K for whatever reason, material uh, limitation, that's not unusual then to say, well, let's design it with a given temperature. Uh, we'll say it's... One bar here, 101.325, and we know it's 101.325 there. Right. Compression ratio of 12, so pressure 2 must be pressure 1 times 12. Make that big. 101.325 times 12 is 1200 and something. 1209 kPa. 12, 15.9, 12, 15.9. And when I'm drawing, you have to shout out if you put your hand up because I can't see you. I have this thing. I'm in a family of school teachers. My mum and dad could see your hand while they're looking at the blackboard, but they did a lot of school teaching. 
All right. Now the question is, what's temperature two? All right. So what are the other properties? What's temperature two? Temperature two on temperature one equals pressure two on pressure one. K minus one on K. Hopefully you've done enough of these types of problems that that looks familiar to you. It's from PV to the K. Actually, one of the um, one of the PSS questions asked you to derive it. I think by combining those two equations, you can get this equation. So these are things we know, T1 is something we know, P2 and P1 are things we know, and K is something that we know. So T2 equals 300 times P2 on P1 becomes 12, which we're given that in the problem. And this will be 0 0.4 divided by 1.4. I have seen that written as 2 on 7. So some textbooks when you're dealing with air will just write 2.7 here, 2 on 7 here. Um, I think it's good to remember that it is K minus 1 on K because then if you are working with a different fluid, um, you'll, you won't get caught with that. Uh, 610... 0.2 Kelvin is what I get from that calculation. And T4 similarly, using P3 and P4, T4 similarly, 639.2 K. So we can substitute those in. We can say... Thirty-nine point two. So that's a, our table filled out, which is a typical way of solving these sorts of problems. Take your known data, fill out a property table, and then uh, draw some conclusions from it. So question A, the gas temperature at the exits of the compressor and the turbine. We'll take that to be the gas temperature at the exit of the turbine, uh, compressor and that to be the so those are the answer to question A, the answers to question A. Question B, the heat addition in the combustion chamber. Any thoughts on, on not the number, but the methodology as to how we would calculate that? The heat addition in the combustion chamber? Q3 minus Q2, I'll agree with that. Q, well, it's not going to be Q, but that's okay, because I know, I know what you're getting at. It's going to be something about number three and something about minus number two. Yes? Good, it's going to be T3 minus T2. It's going to be a C. Can someone help? Why is it CP and not CV? It's isobaric, yes, good. Yeah, yeah. What we find is that for open systems, we're generally dealing with enthalpy, and for closed systems, we're generally dealing with uh, energy only. I'm going to run out of time. Check it out, though. And in our, in our PowerPoint as well, it ended up being CPs all the way down because it's an open system. I am running out of time. C, the back work ratio. So back work ratio is the amount of work required to run the compressor divided by the amount of work that you get out of the turbine. In, that case, in this case, the amount of work required to run the compressor will be CP times the difference in those two temperatures. The amount of work that you get out of the turbine, those aren't temperatures, those are pressures. Uh, this is work compressor will be CP times the difference in those two values. And the work that we get out of the turbine will be 
Cp times the difference in those two temperatures. And I should say it's a power term, not a work term, because it'll be per second. And then thermal efficiency, we can calculate either knowing the R and K values and using the formula, or um, by looking at the work divided by the heat in. I'll unhide the PowerPoints and re-upload that so you've got the typed version as well, but that's my handwritten version. Any quick questions to finish us off? That was the Brayton cycle. We'll come back, we'll talk about isentropic efficiencies and then Rankine cycle. Thanks guys, see you next week.